Today, we're checking in on the latest and greatest Starship events happening right now in Boca Chica, Texas. Then we'll go over this week's Starlink updates, see what launches are coming our way, then finish with today's honorable mention. I'm Kevin, and this is SpaceX in the News. I think we're at the point where we can confidently say that Elon has turned his Starship facilities into a bona fide Starship factory, because it's not getting any easier to keep up with their progress. But we shall try, and we'll start with Monday's events. Starship prototype serial number 6, or SN6, that recently hopped to 150 meters and back was transported down Highway 4 to the shipyard from which it came. There it was swapped out for Mini-Me, a small yet stronger 7.1 prototank. That 304L stainless steel test dummy, with stand included, was paraded to the launch site just hours later. It was tested last night, but not to failure. Not yet. That could be happening as early as Monday, backup dates following. A nose cone was recently shoved back into an assembly bay. Perhaps SN8 will be receiving its fins soon. Its aft fin aero covers have also been spotted on site. SN9 is about half built. SN10 is getting its act together. And yes, even SN11 decided to join the party. See? Starship factory. Yet still, there is more than Starship construction going on. It's expected that the Super Heavy booster has begun its development, its orbital launch mount has received its legs, all six of them, and the high bay in which it will be stacked is about complete. And still, more is happening outside of Boca. On Friday night, SpaceX tweeted an image of their first Raptor vacuum engine for Starship. It has been shipped from their headquarters in Hawthorne, California to McGregor, Texas, where they'll light those fires and spook all the moo cows. <laughs> the cows are confused. <laughs> this is a test engine, says Elon. Flight articles are fixed and will not gimbal. That is to say, they won't steer the rocket. This particular engine has about a 50% chance of not destroying itself. It's worth noting that with these vacuum engines, the thrust is only slightly higher with the big bell nozzles. Larger bells are primarily for efficiency in the vacuum of space. Aiming for 380 plus specific impulse long term, however for right now it's likely to be about 372. And for reference, Merlin vacuum used on the second stage of Falcon 9s is 303. The United States Space Force isn't sure yet if it will ever need to buy into such power. Brigadier General Jason Cawthorn, who oversees launch services procurement for the branch, is quoted in a Space News article stating that the type of launch vehicle they will need, quote, depends on the threats, end quote. To that I say, if you want to exterminate a bunch of space bugs, you better have Elon on speed dial, sir. Regardless of what other agencies or companies may or may not have in mind for Starship's future, you should keep in mind that its primary use will be to take humans with a thing for red dirt to Mars. And if you ever worked for SpaceX down there in South Texas, like Paul Kipperone did for a summer, this mission to Mars is something you would hear about on the regular. Paul wrote an article for Medium detailing his experience while working in Boca Chica, and although I get to speak to SpaceX employees from time to time, things like this are always fascinating to learn about. So for those of you who are students watching this right now, please pay very close attention to this part of the video. As I was just saying, one of the first things concerning company culture Paul learned about was SpaceX's focus on their mission. He once overheard someone say to a coworker, does this get us to Mars faster? No? Then skip it for now. Having a clear mission keeps the path to the finish line under your feet. Sure, that path is rarely a straight line, Obviously, obstacles will need to be navigated, but reminding yourself what exactly it is you are trying to achieve will keep you moving in the right direction. Second is SpaceX's emphasis on taking extreme ownership of what you personally are responsible for. If something goes wrong or progress slows down because of an issue that arose under your project or piece of hardware, then that's on you. Don't blame others for the stuff you own. Makes sense, doesn't it? They also aren't afraid of hurting feelings if truth needs to be told. Add to that a zero tolerance policy for excuses and you would find a similar environment in the SEAL teams. When it comes to efficiency, it works and it works well. And really it's a lesson everyone should apply in their own personal lives. I think there would be less garbage behavior and more outcome based happiness in society right now if more people would abandon their victimhood mentality and adopt this personal responsibility mindset. And finally, Paul met very few people at SpaceX who fit the nerdy STEM dude stereotype. After hearing the things I just mentioned, does that really come as a surprise to you? Learn how to socialize more than just communicate. As a science teacher and now with YouTubing, I found that ner nerds who fit the stereotype, while knowledgeable, absolutely suck at relations. Learn what a joke is and how to take one. Learn how not to offend, but work even harder to not be offended. 
because from what I keep hearing, working for SpaceX is an intense work environment. Long hours of hard manual labor. But the perks, like building a Mars rocket, the purpose that comes with it, and yeah, of course, the free snacks, as you can imagine, are quite rewarding. All right, let's move on to Starlink news. A few days ago, SpaceX published a video on their YouTube channel that took viewers on an entire trip to space and back through the lens of the last Starlink mission's first stage booster camera. It was pretty sweet, but all I could think about while I was watching it was, man, Starship's descent and landing is going to be quite the carny ride. Oh, we're gonna die! <laughs> that booster did return to the Cape on Tuesday, where its legs were folded up and she was loaded for transport. During the mission, it was revealed to us that SpaceX had put laser beams in space on two previous launched Starlink satellites. With these space lasers, the Starlink satellites were able to transfer hundreds of gigabytes of data. Once these space lasers are fully deployed, Starlink will be one of the fastest options available to transfer data around the world. It's just too bad that Elon didn't go into marine biology. You know, I have one simple request. And that is to have sharks with frickin' laser beams attached to their heads. On September 4th, SpaceX sent a letter to the FCC to request a modification of their KUKA ban license they currently hold with the government agency. Basically, SpaceX wants to slightly reduce their number of satellites to 4,408 and move the remaining ones to lower altitudes. But they also included their latest speed test results for their Constellation's closed beta testing. Users in Seattle, Washington were getting download speeds over 100 megabits per second, upload speeds over 40, and latency speeds under 20 milliseconds. But this is really cool. NASA and Arabic on Twitter shared a video they found of Starlink satellites coming through the Earth's atmosphere over the weekend. Obviously, they were defunct sats no longer in operation. SpaceX designed them to fully disintegrate during re-entry. Looking at what's to come, we do have the launch of the 13th flock of Starlink sats scheduled for 2.17 p.m. Eastern Time on September 17th. That's next Thursday. We'll see if it holds. ULA is poised to launch their Delta Heavy rocket for their third try just eight hours later. Some not bad news, but sad news, is that the next Falcon Heavy launch with a Space Force payload has slipped from November, December to February. Some are speculating that the delay is more COVID related rather than SpaceX prioritizing their Falcon 9s. Now it's time for today's honorable mention. A year and a half ago, Rocket Lab announced their intentions to convert their Electron Rocket's kickstage into a spacecraft of its own, called Photon. Until recently, the kickstage was primarily used to deploy customers' payloads after the second stage completes its orbital insertion burn. But if Rocket Lab has it their way, Photon will also provide customers with full bus capability. That is to say, it will provide power, thermal management, and attitude control for satellites, therefore lessening the workload of their customers and allowing them to focus solely on their own payloads. And Photon can even be modified to take those payloads outside low Earth orbit to the moon and beyond. Just last week, Rocket Lab CEO Peter Beck announced their first successful deployment of a demo Photon, nicknamed First Light, after the launch of their last mission. I can't believe it's not optical. Upon releasing the Sequoia satellite, Mission Controller sent commands to First Light to place it into Photon satellite mode. It even had a little camera on it. It's intended to be a technology demonstrator for potential customers to try out and will remain in orbit for the next five years. Beck says more demo photons will be launched in upcoming missions until the first operational one for NASA's Capstone CubeSat is launched into lunar orbit in 2021. Well, that's all I have for you guys today, but I'd like to publicly thank my eccentric supporters on Patreon and here on the YouTube membership program for making these videos possible. If you like tuning in for all the latest SpaceX news, why not check out the links in the description below and consider signing up for more news in your week for as little as $3 a month. $5 will get you access to my live coverage of non-SpaceX launches, okay? And while you're down there, don't forget to support local SpaceX photographers. Please have a nominal weekend, and until the next one, Godspeed.